Hello and welcome back to the Hungaro Ring for day two of Eurosports coverage of the Hungarian Grand Prix, round 10 of the Formula One World Championship. Coming up in this program, all our regular features, as well as the latest news from the pit lane, and of course, the final battle for pole position, the second day of official practice for the Hungarian Grand Prix. Well, it's a bit windier than yesterday. Although the sunshine has remained, we did have some overnight rain. John Watson, what effect do you think that'll have on today's proceedings? Well, I think it'll not affect the qualifying session this afternoon too much. The rain washed the track, the line and the circuit clean, but of course, an hour and a half in the morning's put new rubber down. But really, we've got an interesting situation. Goodyear have produced yet another new front qualifying tyre. That's the tyre most teams this morning were trying out. So they've got to decide whether they want to run the front tyre from yesterday or the new tyre they had available this morning. Thanks very much, John. Lots more from you later on. But for now, let's check up on the latest news from the pit lane. Well, yes, Matthew, but not from the pit lane. In fact, from the media centre, where on Friday, Bertie Eccleston made a very important announcement, along with the Minister of Transport for Hungary, about the future of the Hungarian Grand Prix. It is to continue, and a new contract calls for another five years, but Eccleston wasn't disposing anything about the money. Well, Eccleston, one-time owner of the Brabham team, and problems with them in the past week, apparently locked out of their factory, some dispute over money of course, but we turn to Herbie Blash, the team manager, to find out the very latest situation. Well, I prefer not to go into it really. Uh, the fact is the factory is open as of today, and really that's the only comment I can make. Can I ask you though if it hampered your progress for this particular race? Uh, not really, because the transporters were on the way last week, so not a really major problem. So a minor difficulty which you've overcome? As normal. Well, Brabham, of course, swapping to Yamaha next year, and news that this team, Delara, will next year be the exclusive users of the new V10 Judd engine. The BMS Scudia Italia team have made an exclusive arrangement for Formula One racing only. Another Italian team with a new engine for 1991 is, of course, Minardi, and that shock announcement some months ago that they were going to have Ferrari engines. Well, the first engine has apparently been delivered and quite a lot of interest who will be driving there next season. What about present incumbent Paolo Barilla? I talked to him. Have you made a contract for next year yet? Not yet, and uh, now I'm looking and pushing Minardi to keep me in the team, so I have to show a good shape here. And of course, with the Ferrari engine, quite a lot of other drivers maybe will try and get your seat. Yeah, I think that will be one of the best teams of next year, above the... Um, the top three or four, it will be, I think, the next one. So many drivers want to get it. In England, I think people know you from the, the Pasta family that you come from, and the fact they may consider you a rich kid, in the American expression, do you think this has hampered your motor racing career at all? Well, at the beginning, for sure, I, I could start because uh, my family helped me. But uh, after three years, I decided to, to do it in the professional way, so I gave up all uh, the help of the family. And that is the reason why I went to, to Group C, because it was not possible for me to get a single-seater car at the time. So, but now I am happy in my situation. Now, what's all this? I recognize that crash helmet. It's John Watson, and this is a modern piece of film shot only last weekend. John Watson in a McLaren. I believe the circuit is Schleitzer-Dreieck in East Germany. John, what's it all about? Well, last weekend I went to East Germany for Marlborough for a little bit of promotion, and quite naturally the company provided me with suitable, a suitable vehicle to drive around the circuit in. This car is a 1985 turbo chassis, but it's got a Ford V8 DFR engine in it, not quite as quick as maybe the old tag turbo was, but still quick enough for a 44-year-old John Watson. Yes, and it certainly looks a very exciting circuit indeed, and John enjoying the thrill of being back in a single-seater racing car again. Well, this is round 10 of the Formula One World Championship, and it's at this time of year, every year, the people in the pit lane are busy discussing who's going to be doing what and who'll be driving for who next year. And I'd like to ask John Watson about the future of Ayrton Senna. John, arguably the best driver on the circuit, and yet currently in some dispute with McLaren. Yes, uh, first of all, I think it's inconceivable Ayrton Senna will drive for another team next year, but he's in a big dispute with Honda McLaren, and Ron Dennis, the boss of the team, and Ayrton Senna have got two very strong wills, and neither of them is prepared to concede. One's looking for a one-year contract and more money, the other one's a multi-year contract and less money. 
Edmondson appears to have a viable option with the Williams Renault team, but really I can't see Senna driving anywhere next year other than McLaren and Honda. But who's going to concede first? Well, that's going to be the biggest story of the year. And what happens as a consequence of those two getting together will affect the outcome of all the other drivers who are looking to find a new seat, a new team for 1991. Thanks very much, John. Well, over the recent weeks, uh, a lot of you have been writing in to ask about some of the great women behind the great men in the pit lane, and uh, ever eager to oblige, we've uh, sought some out for you. First on our list was the rather beautiful Nelly Elena, girlfriend of Emanuele Pirro. How did you get into uh, motor racing, Elena? When I was studying law at university, I never went to the lessons, so I was doing some jobs as a hostess, and one of these jobs was for Champion, the Sparflux company. And I went to Monte Carlo Grand Prix as a hostess on the boat. They were always having a boat there. So I met Emanuele also in that occasion. That was how I began in mud racing. But in fact, you did qualify for law, didn't you? And you, in fact, are a contract lawyer. Are you doing any work at the moment? No, I've been working one year when Emanuele was still in Japan because I needed to work a little bit. But uh, for the moment, I don't work as a lawyer. I just enjoy to stay in Rome, to go to the Grand Prix. I don't work for the moment. So you don't work, but of course you've got to look after uh, Mr. Perro, and that's quite a hard job, isn't it? Uh, let's say we do, as girlfriends and wives, you do more of public relations than something else, because we cannot do anything anymore, like taking times, it's not possible. It's all getting so, so professional. The wives, they don't help in that way, but they help as a public relations for the husband or the boyfriend. So that's what we do, and we're always there when they need some help, when uh, they want to complain, it's, they complain with us, they don't go to other people. So. How pent up do you get? Because uh, two weeks ago we saw him having an accident. Uh, how do you react to that? Ah, let's say, going. me, I prefer to go to the race itself, not to look television, because you know immediately what's going on. But it's always a stress because you have at one side the stress of being worried that he has an accident. But on the other side you like to see him make results. So you have also the stress that you want to see a result. So you're really between two stresses, I would say. And you've got a bit of a trademark, haven't you? I think maybe you ought to look at your shoes because uh, you do make a feature of them. Yes, I like shoes. So I have some different uh, types of shoes. Sometimes I wear shoes in the shape of a dog, then I have a cap. Now I have all funny designs on it, so I like shoes. What about the future? Any plans for a family? <laughs> okay, Manuel is not here. I can say normally we should get married in October, and then of course I, maybe I wait one year, but of course we make one family. We're not going to wait five, six years, so it's okay. From beauty to breaks, time now for our technical file. And the man to tell us about them, Patrick Head, technical director of Williams, who's been talking to Andrew Marriott. Well, Patrick Head, in the last decade, there's been a huge change in brakes on racing cars, and you're holding there a carbon fibre disc, and it is very different from the old cast iron disc, isn't it? Yes, I mean, the, obviously the first thing one notices when holding it is it's much lighter than a, a cast iron disc, but... I think probably more significant to the car, it has uh, a much, with its also carbon pad, has a much higher friction coefficient than the uh, old brakes and is also stable over a fairly wide temperature band, although it's uh, still possible to run them too hot and very significantly also it's possible to run them too cold, so you'll tend to see a lot of uh, brake ducts up and down the pit, pit lane having bits of tape put on them and taken off them and people looking at the temperature indicators on the outside of the discs and poking temperature sensors into the brakes so that they keep them within their uh, good operating band. Also see mechanics regularly cleaning them and uh, presumably taking off some sheen on the outside. Yes, I mean this is a, a term that used to be referred to on cast iron brakes as well which is uh, would be called glazing of the brakes which uh, is it probably much more complicated than anything we or I understand but it, it basically is a shining of the surface of the brake usually comes about from running the brakes too cool um, which gives them a lower friction coefficient on the outside and once they've achieved this shine it uh, is very difficult to break through generally 
uh, the car set can last sometimes uh, quite a long time, two or three races worth, although we'll generally always start a race with a new set of brakes on, um, to the very heavy braking circuits like Adelaide and Imola, where generally the brakes might be just used for a bit of testing afterwards. How drastically have they actually reduced the braking distances? By 20%, 30%? I couldn't give you an exact answer to that, but I think it's closer to, to half, uh, which obviously has a big effect in terms of the length of the amount of time one has uh, uh, to overtake another car under braking is, is very much less. But I, I think it's, it's more closer to, to a 50% reduction. Yeah. I suppose circuits where we they use very heavily, like Imola, where we're pulling nearly 200 miles an hour and break down to about 70, 80. It's about a 1.7, 1.8 second application in order to get you from 200 miles to an hour down to about 80 miles an hour. So it, it's a pretty violent. I mean, the driver is being held in the car, hanging on his seat belts, and his eyes are tending to want to go shooting out of their sockets and things like that. I mean, it's it's. That's one of the things that you really don't see on television is what a violent uh, environment it is for the driver and, and in terms of braking it's pretty much caused by these uh, devices. Time now for a quick break but we'll be back in a couple of moments with highlights of the final qualifying session for the Hungarian Grand Prix when we'll find out who's to be on pole position. Join us then. Back to the Hungaro ring coming up straight away the most exciting part of the weekend so far the final qualifying session for the Hungarian Grand Prix. Let's straight away join your commentators, John Watson and Andrew Marius. You're all back at the Hungara ring. There is Satoru Nakajima, number one son from Japan, going out in the Tyrol. A little disappointing yesterday, quite a lot slower than his teammate. Well, in fact, Nakajima has just come in to the pits, Andrew, he's had his car weighed, and he has improved. He's now up to 11th spot from 14th on Friday, so his Pirelli qualifiers obviously have helped him a little bit again today. Boots are now commencing the first flying lap. And yesterday they were one of the few teams that uh, ran two sets of qualifying tyres and they did benefit from that. They're Boots are in sixth spot currently, Patrese in fifth spot. So let's have a little look and see what Mr. Boots is going to try and do Saturday afternoon with his set of qualifying boots. Well, John, he's won one race this weekend because uh, Friday night saw a, a function, one of the team's sponsors, with radio-controlled cars and uh, driving a facsimile, a similar copy of his car, the whole miniature Amiya model, against Ricardo Patrese and Patrick Head. Fiori Bootson was the clear winner around the, the floor of a, a hotel ballroom. Just watching the amount of movement that Bootson is having to make on the steering wheel. I don't think he's got a balance in the car that he really is very happy with. He's having to take a lot more steering lock, turning into corners to get the front to grip. So I suspect that the imbalance, this ever sought balance the driver is looking for, he's a little bit wide coming around that corner onto the pit straight. 19.047 to Thierry Bootson, definitely an improvement, half a second of improvement. Bumps him up to four spots, so despite John's theory that he wasn't happy with the balance of the car, and John may well be right, of course, still a very good lap from the Belgian. In the car with Nigel Mansell. Mansell has just turned a 118.719, just come up on the screen, Mansell. 118.719, just a fraction quicker than his time yesterday. Makes no difference to the overall standings. Is currently Berger Mansell, Alesi Bootsen, Nanini Patrese, Pique de Cesaris, Piro and Martini. Eric Warwick now back in the 11th spot. And the four not in. Currently Tarquini in the AGS. David Brabham, who hasn't been out yet. Gregor Foytek and JJ Leto, who has finally been out. He didn't go out yesterday with that... Uh, differential problem uh, but he has only recorded a 125.681 so he sits at the bottom of the pile currently and Gerhard Berger still to go out sits at the top of the pile well center out now just uh, on his first warm-up lap 
man who really does need to improve. Wheel up on the curb there. Well, that type of thing isn't particularly helpful because it unsettles the car and also can unsettle the aerodynamics of the car by letting the car rise up the way the air flows around and under the car that can actually cause a momentary loss of downforce loss of grip and of course the corresponding amount of time lost yes just nipping past his old uh, flatmate Monsieur Gujomin and the uh, McLaren touching about a fair bit Powering up the hill now, the V10 Honda engine. The fourth modification apparently of this engine and apparently some little changes also for this racetrack. And coming under the bridge at 109, indicates a pretty quick lap. Definitely he is going to improve. 118.162, Ayrton Senna joins his teammate Gerhard Berger on the front row of the grid watching Gerhard Berger now and look how twitchy his car appears under braking there the front of the car darting all over the place but Gerhard really he's an honorary Hungarian for this weekend driving absolutely on the limit he wants to retain his pole position still looking for his first victory in a Honda McLaren and uh, he does seem here on the Hungaro ring to have been getting more from his car than teammate Senna has so far but of course Senna and I right on his door. And Berger and I with the pressure of knowing that Senna's got a second set of tyres and is capable of doing anything. There's nothing that this man isn't capable of in a Grand Prix car with all that tally of pull positions since 88. But Berger looking to be very quick in fact. Just kissing the kerb coming out of that little sequence now. This tight second gear, left hand corner up to third gear for the right hander. Leading on to the pit straight. A little bit of sliding in the front of the car as he came through there. Everybody really has that problem. 18-7. But his uh, boots and meanwhile has gone out and snatched pole position. You didn't see it on your screen, but Thierry Bootsen has put in a lap of 117.919. As we see, Gregor Foytek pushed away, obviously had a spin. But Bootsen, the big news. Well, that came out of the blue, Andrew, didn't it? We didn't have anybody looking at him at all. He went out there, has done a, st a stunning time. 1.7 seconds quicker than his time from yesterday. And that really has rocked the pit lane because they were just getting accustomed to seeing, well, the two McLarens back in the front row again. Suddenly, Bootsen has gone out, done a 17.919 and is back on, or is on pole position. Not back on it, he's on pole position. Yes, a man who has never that on the pole in his Formula One career. Well, that'll be interesting. Interesting also to see what uh, Ricardo Patrese can do. Presumably Williams have a very good setup as the Lazy goes out now. This is the Lazy's third run and he looks all fired up. He's dropped back to sixth spot. We'll just recap quickly. It's Bootsen and Berger now on the front row. Senna and Mansell on row two. Nannini and the Lazy. Then Patrese, Piquet, the Jesuits and Prost. Get another slow car on the lazy's way, will it? Get out of the way, let him through. Yes, appears to be no trouble. Now he's got, got Martini. Martini, yes. He had to go right up the curb, which is very good because he gave a lazy all the room he needed. A lazy on a, I would say, the most aggressive looking of his three laps so far. Back in sixth spot. This is the one race in this part of the season he felt he had a chance of getting a good result, getting past. Ligier, now almost complete, of course, with so little power to use in comparison to those five cars ahead of him, scrabbling for grip. 19.4, and that hasn't done anything to improve a lazy. No, he's the lazy. Perhaps he was overdriving, John, as you suggested. As we go with uh, Ricardo Patrese. He's got a slower car in the way. Yeah, but this is only an outlap, Andrew. It's, uh, this isn't a problem for him. He's just going out to try and uh, build himself up, find the clear part of track, and then begin that 
second go at qualifying his teammate has rocked the pit lane with a 117.919 the Tracy currently on seventh on the grid with a 119.345 so a lot of time the Tracy is going to have to find yes, you, you say they rocked the pit lane I think it's because everyone was actually concentrating on, on a different car because Gerhard was out there at the time and they weren't really taking uh, much notice of uh, Mr. Bootson. Well, of course, everybody in motor racing is a, a pigeonhole expert, and uh, I think they had pigeonholed Bootson probably in about sixth in the grid. And uh, suddenly there he is in pole position, and a very impressive lap it is too. A pigeonhole expert. I like that, John. I haven't heard that one before. Well, I've been victimized by pigeonhole experts many times. I'm an expert on it too. Well, I don't know what pigeonhole they put you in. I put you in the pigeonhole of one of Britain's greatest drivers, five times Grand Prix victor. John Watson, my co-commentator, giving you unparalleled... Um, I have to put my teeth back in, John. Unparalleled in, insight. Uh, you, he's poking me now, you see. He's uh, unnerving me. Unparalleled insight into Grand Prix racing. Well, here we're looking at Bootsman in the pits, but really what we want to be seeing is... But here we are, back with Ricardo Patrese. He really is giving his Williams and his Goodyear tyres a bit of a sing-to. Patrese looking very quick indeed. His car appearing to be very well balanced so far. Coming up now to this final left-hand corner. Second gear getting on the power. The back end stepping out a little bit into third gear. Or hard over to the right. Try and get the front to tuck in. You've got to get in a bit earlier than that, Ricardo, I would say. But this looks to be a pretty impressive lap from Patrese. Yes! 17.955. We now have an all Williams Renault front row of the grid. The Tracy just a little shy of Bootson's best, but a good lap. You rode with him as he did it here on Eurosport. Now Senna, is he going on a quick run, John? Yes, he's about to pick up speed now. Although he let that Brabham go through, he will have to pass it somewhere on that lap. Hopefully he'll find a clear spot on the track. Maybe David Brabham was just finishing a lap and he will hopefully look at his mirrors and let Senna through. Yes, David Brabham was, and he did improve by a substantial amount, 122.488, but that is not good enough to get him in the race. Still in 28th spot. Yes, he's going to have to do a low 22 to even consider being in the race, but look at Senna. He came around that right-hand corner of the car, absolutely sideways. He's now decided, uh-oh, I'm going to stop. I lost time doing that. I'm going to take it back to the pits very slowly, keep those qualifying tyres in as good a nick as I can do, but that was a major slide. He got a full opposite lock on. Let's watch it again. Look at the back end stepping out. Too much throttle. He gave the car a fairly major yank in the steering wheel to get it into the corner. And now here he goes again. Not Second qualifying attempt, part two. Yes, not much time left. Those seven minutes. Enough to put in a quick one, however. Flashes under the bridge. Downhill. And again, the back of the car stepped out really, really... I don't know what Senna has done to his car. He has made changes to the car, but that's... Again, let's watch him through here again. Look at the way the car's fidgeting and twitching. I believe he's got an awful lot of downforce and a lot of the bias of the car's handling onto the front. He wants the front of the car to stick, but he's gone almost too far, and the back of the car is loose, and that's what's causing it to step out and look very unstable. And really, now locking up a right front, well, I would say that Ayrton has decided to go home. I mean, he's driven off the track. That's just the worst qualifying attempt I've seen Ayrton Senna produce in a very long time indeed. And I would think he's pits bound after that. Whatever he's done to his car, it's really upset the handling. Uncharacteristic to see Senna make him an error like that, locking up that right front brake, deciding not to go through this slow chicane, opted to go across the curb, across the grass, over the little bit of that gravel trap, back on the track of course those qualifying tires now full of gravel full of the dust and the hot the, 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 the singed grass that's by the track i would say ertensen has really blown any chance he has of improving certainly in this set of tires well here is frost all-time winningest grand prix driver as they say in america pretty horrible word actually but uh, that is the fact as Gerhard Berger continues. Isn't Berger now just beginning 
first timed lap, second set of qualifying tyres. And I uh, don't expect to see Gerhardt's car look so unruly as we saw Senna's a few moments ago. Gerhardt, I think, is the less fluid of the two drivers in terms of pure style, but certainly very efficient around the Hungara ring this weekend. And again, look at that, absolutely sideways in the track. Whatever McLaren have done to these two cars, both appear to be set up fairly similarly, and the back end of the car does not have an awful lot of grip in that very quick right-hand corner. Could there be a problem with the surface there, John? Do you think that's catching them out? No, I think this is a deliberate... Oh, and look at Berger, my goodness, he missed the corner, absolutely. Now, I wonder if that's, that actually could be a quick lap while he's backed off. There's something that is something completely... I don't know what to say. We so saw Senna do that a few moments ago, and now Berger coming down to the same part of the track. Back end, stepping out very early in the exit of the corner. A real handful. Alan Pross now having his second run. Pross car, let's say now at this stage, will not appear to be as anything like on really as we've just watched the two McLarens be. But of course, Prost back in 10th spot and not getting the best out of his qualifying tyres. Again, that I put down very much to his particular driving technique. I'm not even looking anything like as authoritative today on the racetrack as we expect him to be tomorrow come the race. But again, Prost's car, a little bit fidgety on the exit of that long third gear right-hand corner. Just a minute and a half remaining. The four not in. Yannick Damas, David Brabham, JJ Leto, who's actually put in a 122.6, and uh, Gregor Foytek. So this very much is a last-ditched attempt by Alan Prost to move up the grid. And we also see a Williams out there. We've got Ricardo Patrese just ahead of Alan Prost and Prost is going to get held up by Patrese. Patrese about to commence the lap, Prost concluding his lap and of course that's slowing Prost down. He's not able to maintain that momentum he was building up. But a 119.029 has brought him up to eighth spot, fourth row of the grid for Alan Prost, a small improvement. Well, the session is over and we do have a williams Renault front row of the grid, Bootsen and Patrese. On the second row, it is Berger and Senna. On row three, Mansell and Alesi. On row four, Nanini and Prost. Then, completing the top 10, it's Piquet and De Cesaris. Warwick and Bernard, 11th and 12th. Then Pirro, Bartini, Nakajima, Capelli, Guzelman, Donnelly, Suzuki and Modena. 21st, Philip Alio. Then it's Alberetto, Barilla, Tarquini, Larini. Caffey, the man who was on the bubble, stays in. And the four who didn't make it, Damas, Brabham, Leto and Foyte. Uh, congratulations. Uh, how do you feel about being on pole position? Well, I feel very good. It's my first pole position. It was uh, very hard to get here because uh, the car was not very well set up yesterday. I had to work hard to think about it very much uh, last night. This morning I ran full tanks and the car was not very, very good. And at the end of the, the, the morning I had a lot of gearbox problems that we could not solve totally for the afternoon. So I used the first set of tires. I had I missed two gears, couldn't get the gear in, and then with the second set of tires we tried to solve the problem with the gearbox, we couldn't do it, so I had to drive very carefully and change gear very slowly. That was the only, uh, only way to do it, so I lost a bit of time there every time I was changing gear, but I didn't make a mistake on the lap, that was the most important thing. Well that's it for day two of Eurosport's coverage of the Hungarian Grand Prix weekend. Day three of course is the race itself and you can see it all live on Eurosport. It starts at two o'clock Central European time, one o'clock in the UK. Join us then but for now it's goodbye.